Let's uh, go ahead and open our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And we're talking about being strong in the Lord, and I think I'm going to end this uh, tonight. Um, this is really, I felt like, you know, I could, sometimes I get into, I could go so many different directions uh, with messages. Over the years, I just keep collecting them and collecting them, and um, I could go a lot of different directions. We could teach on a lot of different subjects, and sometimes, I, I know being under Brother Hagen, uh, repetition was a huge deal with him. I mean, we would sit in services, and you would think, you know, and it, sometimes you get the you get the impression, and even with in our current uh, uh, ministry world, that you need to come up with something new. But this word's just been working just the same as it always has since since well since the Lord gave it to us. Amen. I mean, every time God speaks, faith comes. Amen. And so, uh, but with Brother Hagen, like you know, he'd have. Uh, winter Bible seminar and camp meeting and all these things, and they still do those meetings with uh, uh, Kenneth Hagen uh, Jr., his son, um, who we call Pastor Hagen. But um, uh, Brother Hagen would have ministers come in from all over the world, and he would use the same scriptures, tell the exact same stories over and over and over. I mean, year after year, I could tell you what story he was going to tell when he went to his teaching on prayer. And he would share. And he had a lot of different testimonies that he could have shared. But he said, these are the best ones. And people, he said, people say to me, um, they'd say to him, uh, why don't you find some new scriptures? He says, these ones have worked fine for years. How many know this? When you find something that works, it, why, why dig for something new? You know what I mean? And it's not that he didn't know other scriptures. Obviously, he did. But those scriptures and establishing those things uh, and the way he taught and did things, it, it builds truth in you. So when I was praying in other tongues today about the service and praying in the spirit and praying for you guys and just thinking about, you know, trying to get, getting, I shouldn't say trying, but getting my mind in line with what God wanted to say to you, because how many know you need to be fed and you need to hear what the Lord has to say to you? And so it's my responsibility to go, okay, God, fill me up with what they need. And I'll equip them so they can go work. Amen. Do the work of the ministry, right? And so, um, I, you know, I, I was praying about it. And in the spirit, when I was praying, I just kept seeing... How many have seen... Uh, it's not a crane, but it's, it's similar to a crane. And then on that crane or that big arm, they have like a pounder. And they're, have you ever seen a machine pound those giant pillars into the ground? And I just kept seeing that over and over and over again. And that's how truth is. Truth, if you get the pillars deep enough, and then you anchor your life to those pillars, you're stable. But sometimes truth isn't as deep. It isn't pounded down as far as we think it, as far as it should be. Sometimes we even think it's further down than it is. How many have discovered that at times? Okay. And people say, well, how do you know where you're at? Get in a storm. You'll know quick. Amen? You'll know quick. And people say, well, it's too late. It's never too late with God. Amen? He's a now God. He's an ever-present help in time of need. And uh, sometimes people wonder, you know, I, I've heard this. I did this through the years. I've done this many times. Where I, I, I knew I had head knowledge of the word. And I understood some things, and I was real bold to tell everybody else what they were supposed to do. And then I got in the middle of something, and I went, why am I falling apart? Because I wasn't a doer. I just had a bunch of knowledge. <laughs> you know, you come out of Bible college, and your head swells. All right. And I'll just say, <laughs> I'll just say this. It's not the Bible college's fault. It was my fault. Amen. And so, but you go through life, and how many know life has a way of tempering you? And, and uh, kind of, it, it exposes who you really are versus what you think you are. Now, I'm not talking about positional truths. I'm talking about the truths we've actually walked in. Because positionally, you are who Christ says you are and who he created you to be. But that does not mean you're walking in it. Amen. It doesn't mean that I'm walking in it. Amen. 
And so as we look at some of these scriptures, and we know these scriptures, and we review them, um, uh, just be open to the Holy Spirit and allow Him to minister to you and show you something maybe he didn't, you didn't see before. Um, I have had to really discipline myself to do this because you read through, you know, we read, we do our Bible reading every year. You're reading the same scriptures over and over and over. And it's easy for your natural mind to go click. Yeah, we're just reading through it. But if you're in faith, the Holy Spirit will go, what about this? And you go, oh my goodness, I never saw that before. Amen. And that happens a lot, you know. For those that are seasoned in the Lord, and they have a fellowship with Him, and it gets gooder and gooder every year, right? I mean, I'm stronger today than I've ever been in the Lord. But 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, come on, that only puts me at 74, 40 years from now, 50 years from now, (laughs) okay? And when I get good and old, and I will, I'm going to throw this this thing off. Unless the Lord comes first, and I'm going to sail on to, to heaven. I already told you guys I know how I'm dying, so it's all right. All right. I already know how. All right. It's been prophesied. I already know. All right. I have the prophecy. All right. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 3. You've never met anybody so excited about it, have you? <laughs> this is temporary. What we're doing here. It's very temporary, and the longer I walk with the Lord, the more I realize how easy it is to just go ahead and step into the supernatural and into the spirit. The the spiritual world is more real than this natural world, amen? And I'm not talking about goofy, weird things, okay? I'm not talking about familiar spirits and all that stuff. I'm talking about this is the roadmap right here. And it opens our eyes to things that the natural eye cannot see. How many can testify? You're aware of God more today. Amen? And you're aware He's with you. Now, people will come up to me and they'll say, well, I've seen a vision or I've had a dream and stuff like that. And I don't really, honestly, it doesn't really happen to me that much. But I, know, I see in me. I see with these eyes. Amen? Amen? Because we have spiritual eyes, spiritual ears, all that good stuff. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Now, I could sit right there for a while and teach, but that would be something you should meditate. Especially if you're in contention with somebody, or you have a situation that's difficult, you need to maybe repeat that to yourself. I don't war according to the flesh. I will not fight flesh. Amen? For the weapons, verse 4, the weapons of our warfare are not what? They're not carnal. So we're in a battle that we cannot win with carnal weapons. You're in a fight, I'm in a fight, that we cannot win if we continue to operate in the flesh. There's no way to function in the victory of Jesus Christ if I'm going to fight flesh with flesh. I've got to step out of that realm and get into the spiritual realm and begin to use a spiritual weapon in this fight because the fight that I'm in is not against flesh and blood. And the weapons that I have cannot be grasped with a carnal hand. They can only be grasped with a spiritual hand. And that's the hand of faith. Amen. They can only be grasped with a spiritual hand. And I'm in a fight with an enemy that is unseen. But how many know we are not unaware of who he is and what he does? Because we are not ignorant of his what? Devices, right? So we're in a battle, and it's not a carnal battle. It's not a physical battle. And in this battle, Paul declares, we, we, uh, uh, we're not, let me go back to verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are what? Mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. We talked about this. The word mighty means powerful or capable. Pulling down means destruction, demolition, extinction, or taking down. Strongholds are fortifications. 
In other words, lies create strongholds in our minds, right? Nothing new to any of us, any of us here. We looked at this last week. Deceived thinking, this is what the Lord said to me, produces strongholds in our lives that need to be torn down. From this verse, we see that we have God weapons to pull these enemy strongholds down. Other translations of verse 4, the first part of verse 4 says, our battle is not of flesh, but it is powerful through God. Or I should say this, our weapons are not of flesh, but they are powerful through God. They are divinely powerful. So, what, what, do I, what do I need to get settled in my mind concerning the fight that I'm in? When I'm fighting with God's weapons, they are powerful weapons. I am not grasping spiritual things. I am not functioning in spiritual realities as far as the nature of them being weak or defeated or not able to conquer what the enemy brings my way. Everything that the enemy, enemy brings my way is destroyable, is demolishable, if that's a word, it's wreckable, all right, with the weapons of God. How many know frustration is not the weapon of God? <laughs> Impatience, not the weapon of God. No, that's not one of them. Irritableness. You ever heard of that fruit of the Spirit? <laughs> Wrong spirit. <laughs> Irritableness is not... It's not a weapon of God, okay? That's not a weapon of the Lord. So we can't approach the fight. People say, well, I just had, I already have five things going on, and the sixth showed up. So if the enemy can get you to begin to fight with flesh, carnal, he's got you. I'm not saying there's no hope for you. I'm just saying you're not winning that fight. So you need to rethink, re-gear, step back, get back in the barracks and go, Lord, and he'll take you back to the battle plan. And you go, oh, yeah, I can't fight with them. And the devil will go, but remember what they said to you. How many ever had that devil do that to you? Paint you a picture of how somebody mistreated you, especially those close to you, right? Or those that you have a relationship. How many know that happens? But if I'm going to win that battle, I have to fight with the weapon of forgiveness. Because my fight is not in flesh and blood. So if I go the route of flesh and blood, then I know the enemy. If I go the route of carnal, the enemy's going to get in. And how many know the devil loves carnal fights? He can cause all sorts of problems. Divide friends up that weren't supposed to. Divide, divide friends up, now listen to this, that were God connections. They were divine appointments, graced people that were supposed to connect together. Do you see that? The enemy works at this because he loves to stop the move of God. And so we need to be aware of that. And if we're going to use these weapons, we need to know what they are. And specifically, we're going to talk about being strong today. But let's go to verse 5, and we'll keep going through this. So we need to cast these things down. We need to, we, in this battle, well, there's, there's something that we're going to tear down. We're going to demolish with the powerful weapons of the Lord, of the Lord that he's given us. In verse 5, we see this casting down what? Arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the what? Knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into what? Captivity to the obedience of Christ. So notice, and we talked about this before. If you don't take the enemy's thoughts captive, they'll take you captive. So you need to take captive what wants to take you captive. And you say, how do I do that? You bring it into the obedience of Christ. You bring the thought into captivity. So one of the key things that I see here is you have to have knowledge. Knowledge of who your God is, knowledge of who you are in Christ, knowledge of the covenant that you have with God, and you need to have knowledge of your enemy. So you know how he operates. Because how many know the thing about deception is that it's deceiving? That's the problem with it, right? The major problem with deception is deceiving. In other words, you thinking one way, but it's a deceived thought, 
So you think you're right, but you're actually deceived in your thought. And so knowledge of the Word of God, knowledge of who God is, protects you from deception. It's one of the avenues. And these, the Word of God really, it boils down to that the Word of God is the weapon. The powerful weapon, the mighty weapon that we use against the enemy. Amen? All right? And, and we could talk about other things there, but I'm not going to get into some of those details. But we're to bring every thought into captivity. We're to cast down arguments. That means to take down. It means to lower with violence. That's what that means. Casting down. So what I found out, even in studying some of these different scriptures on strength is, I figured out that God is not gentle with the enemy. He is not. So you don't have to be. Amen. You can go ahead and go ahead and kick. And, and do, come on, how many have ever seen some defense class things and different things like that? Or you've seen somebody that, uh, that uh, 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 is trying to, I, I've seen fights before in high school between girls. I was a, I, st- I got to tell this joke again. This is so funny. One time <laughs> Ian came in, he was real little, and there was an MMA fighting thing on TV going on, and it was two ladies that were fighting. And he looked at me and he goes, huh, I didn't know moms could fight. Oh, I laughed so hard over that. Okay, anyway, that just, that went through my head. I'm sorry, that has, all right. So I saw, the worst fights that I saw in high school were girl fights between two girls. I mean, hands down, the guys were like, you know, you know, okay, you got a black eye, you got a broken nose. Okay, we're good. The girls, man, everything came out. Claws and fists and biting and, my point is this. You don't need to be gentle with your enemy. Break out the claws. Break out everything you got. You know what I mean? Go after him with every weapon, that, that spiritual weapon that the, that the Lord has given you and attack. Move toward him. Drive him away. Amen? Drive him out of your life. Like uh, one minister uh, said to Brother Hagin one time, he said, well, how are you doing? He said, well, I got the devil on the run. And he said, oh, praise the Lord. And the guy said, yeah, but the problem is he's running and he's chasing me and I'm running away. (laughs) And that is the problem. (laughs) Because you're not supposed to let that happen. Now, that doesn't mean you won't have challenges. This is a spiritual principle that will show up in the natural. But you've got to put him on the run. How many know where to submit, therefore, to God? Resist the devil and he will what? Flee from us. Now, the religious church and the religious world will teach you, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. But that's not what the scripture teaches. Amen. You've got authority in the name of Jesus. And how many know this? Your mind is your real estate and you can control it. Amen. You hold the title deed to your mind because of the covenant that you have with Jesus and the jurisdiction and authority that he's given you. That he's purchased for you. Amen. And how many know he paid a big price for it? All right, so we're to take every thought captive, any thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, we're, good, we're to bring it into, the cap, to, into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So there's a principle here that I think you could teach on and even just study out on your own, but bring it into the obedience of Christ. That tells me that every, the, 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 the thoughts that you have about yourself, the thoughts that you have about your, the world that you're in, the situations that you're facing... That one of the best ways to battle with spiritual weapons is to understand who you are in Christ. So you can bring everything that is coming into your mind into the, and run it through the filter of who am I in Christ? And does this right have a, and does this thing have a right to stay in my life? How many know fear doesn't have a right to stay in our lives? Okay? And everybody deals with something. In the area of fear. Everybody does. But God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. How many know it's easier to quote than to walk out? But how many know that these are mighty, powerful weapons and the grace of God is sufficient? Amen? So we can go from being the most afraid, scared person to being the most calm, rested person. Why? By the grace of God. Amen? Not in our own strength. So we're to take these things captive and to bring them into obedience. And that word obedience simply means compliance or submission. So you're to bring every thought into submission to 
Christ. Uh, one commentary says this. It says, Paul determined to bring all non-biblical teaching and thoughts he encountered into captivity. He captured and led away as a prisoner of war every philosophical system and lie of the enemy, which was contrary to the view of which was contrary to the view of this world and himself as set forth in Scripture. Every area of life, both personally and the world around Paul, came into the obedience of the gospel of Christ. In other words, I don't care what you say about what my gender is, the Bible says. In other words, I don't care what comes against me from a personal standpoint of the attack of the enemy. I recognize it's there. I acknowledge that it's there. But the scripture says, and I take that thought captive and bring it into submission to the obedience of what Christ said and who he made me to be. Amen? So the devil can come to me and say, yeah, you messed up. You're, you're, you probably, you're not righteous anymore. And I say to him, I didn't earn that righteousness in the first place. <laughs> How many good deeds did I do to get it? Zilch. Amen? Now, that doesn't mean I think we should try and see how many bad deeds we can do. But what I'm saying is my, righteous, my, my eternity is secure because I'm in Christ. And I am not letting go of that. Amen. How about you? No, I ain't letting go of that one. Oh, devil, you might as well just trot on because you're not hanging out with me. Amen? All right, so we need to realize that we can control our thinking. In other words, we may not be able to stop... Uh, 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 <laughs> Brother Hagin used to say this all the time. We may not be able to stop a bird from flying over our head, but we can keep it from building a nest in our hair. And some people say, that doesn't sound very spiritual. It's very spiritual. In other words, don't let the enemy camp out in your head. I, I got a text the other day, and somebody messaged me about an issue that they were having, and I was very inundated with things, and they wanted to have a phone call, and I was like, I cannot have a phone call right now. And so I prayed. I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And I texted them back, and I said, I'm going to send you a God weapon. And so I sent them a scripture. And I said, you're going to put this in your mouth and speak it all day long. And I, said, and I said, you're going to speak it until the oppression that you feel lifts. Amen. Practice that word, right? And they texted me back, amen, praise God. You know, so, and I never heard anything, so they must have got it. <laughs> but what did I place in their hand? A God weapon. Amen. All right, let's look at some strength scriptures here. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse number 24, and I'm going to go through verse 25. And I'm just going to read these and go down a few because I want to get to a particular point before we close tonight. It says this, Deuteronomy 33, 24, and you can, if you don't want to turn to them, you just rather jot these down. These are all going to deal with strength and the strength of the Lord. It says this, and of Asher, he said, Asher is most blessed of sons. Let him be favored by his brothers and let him dip his foot in oil. Your sandals shall be iron and bronze. As your days, so shall your strength be. How many know that's a good verse right there? In the Amplified, it says this, and as your days, so shall your strength, your rest and security be. The NIV says, and your strength will equal your days. In other words, i got strength for every day. Amen? Uh, in the uh, New Living, it says this, May you be secure all your days. In the complete Jewish Bible, it says, Your strength lasts as long as you live. Amen. And the scripture says you'll be satisfied with long life. Amen. In, the, in, in God's Word translation, it says this, May your strength last as long as you live. In other words, God wants you strong. 2 Samuel 22, verse 38 and 39 and verse 40 says this, I have pursued my enemies and destroyed them. This is David. Neither did I turn back again till they were destroyed. I love that. He did not turn back until they were destroyed. Amen. Now, in the spirit, we know the enemy is already defeated. But how many know we have to enforce that? Amen. That was two people. How many know that we have to enforce that victory? Amen? We have to enforce it. That means, and you, can't, you can get people to agree with you, but ultimately you have to enforce it for you. Because I can't live with you. 
I think sometimes people think they, 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 you know, they wish somebody could. You know, you just do all my fighting for me. That would only last so long. No, God, God has anointed you to win against your enemy. Amen. All right. So he, said, he goes on to say this in verse 39, and I have destroyed them and wounded them so that they could not rise. I love this. They have fallen under my feet. This sounds like New Testament, Luke chapter 10, victory to me. For you have armed me with strength for the battle. Somebody say, I have strength for the battle. You have subdued under me those who rose against me. How many know Jesus did this? Psalms chapter 27, verse number 14. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage. He shall strengthen your heart. He says, wait, I say, on the Lord. The Amplify says, wait and hope for and expect the Lord. Expect. I like that. This is not just a wait and see. This is a wait and look. In other words, God is not the God of, well, we'll see what happens. God is, I made the promise, you look, because I'm coming. I'm coming. Amen? We wait expectantly. Be brave and of a good courage. I like this. And let your heart be stout and enduring. Does that sound weak to you? Does that sound like, oh, poor me, I'm just a Christian. What am I going to do? The Democrats are taking over. (laughs) Ah. No, we're stout hearted. Right? So, (laughs) So, I can always get a nerve on that one. (laughs) We're stout hearted in the Lord. We have hope. We have an expectation, and how many know this? God has not even come close to falling off his throne. He is not old and decrepit. He is not, I'm not going to say that. I'm going to move on, but I almost made a, all right. So, be of good courage. One of the things about this strengthening thing in this verse is this. Strengthen in this verse means to establish, fortify, harden, and it means obstinate. Isn't that interesting? You know, it's good to be obstinate against your enemy. It's good. It's, obstinate is stubbornly refusing to change one's opinion or chosen course of action despite attempts to persuade one to do so. <laughs> now, I was stubborn before I was saved. <laughs> but now that I'm saved, I'm stubborn on one opinion about myself. And it's what he says about me. Whatever he says, that's what we say. That's what we say about us. And so when the devil comes, you go, I'm just obstinate, devil. You're just going to have to leave. I'm strong in the Lord. I, I'm aware of who my God is and what he said about me. And I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not gonna, I'm going to be stout-hearted here and not budge. I'm going to be of good courage and fight on. Amen. Until I see what the Lord has said to me. You know what this reminds me of, and you can look at it later. But Mark 5, 35 and 36, where Jairus came to Jesus and they said, that in verse 36, they, uh, verse 35, they, they, they said to Jairus, they said, your daughter's dead, don't trouble the master anymore. Jesus turned around to him and said, don't, do not be afraid, only believe. And if you read it, it's kind of interesting, especially if, if you read it in the Amplified in verse 36, it talks about the fact that Jesus heard what they said, but ignored it. Do you know what that is? Obstinate. Amen. See, in our natural thinking, we go, well, you don't know how bad it is. And Jesus goes, ignoring that. This is what the Father wants to do. I heard faith in this man, and I'm not going to let that faith go. So then he go, he turn, Jesus turns around quickly, says to Jairus, what? Do not be what? Do not be afraid. Only, only believe. Does that sound like a choice to you? Because it does to me. In other words, what do you think he was feeling at that moment? He just heard, he knows his daughter's sick. He knows she's close to death. And he just heard what? She's dead. And Jesus turns around and goes, don't fear, only believe. 
And what did Jairus do? He got obstinate. Amen. Amen. He's a man in faith and things got worse before they got better. Even when he got to his house, Jesus had to kick out all his friends, supposed friends. They weren't faith buddies. <laughs> Amen? And they got obstinate. And what happened? His daughter was raised. And they ate. Because that's a good thing to do after you have a miracle. Eat food. All right. Psalms 27, 14. Wait and hope for and expect the Lord. Be brave and have a good courage and let your heart be stout and enduring. This is the amplified of that verse. Yes, wait for and hope for and expect the Lord. Psalms 28, 7, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices and with song I will praise him. I like that verse. Psalms 29 verse 11, the Lord is the strength of is str- the Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with what? Peace. Psalm 46 verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very what? Present help in time of trouble. Well, I'm in trouble. He's present and he's helping. Amen. I love that about that. Uh, that passage, because it covers, these verses cover all the bases. Psalm 68, verse 28, your God has commanded your strength. Strengthen, O God, what you have done for us. I like this. This is a command. He's commanded your strength. And that word strength means to harden or to prevail. God has commanded your prevail. He's commanded it. And it's working and operating. Psalms 118 verse 14. The Lord is my strength in song. He has become my salvation. Psalm 138 verse 3. In the day when I cried out, you answered me. And made me bold with strength in my soul. Isaiah 30 verse 15. For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel. In returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. Amen. Isaiah 40, verse 29, he gives power to the weak, and those who have no might, he what? Increases strength. Come on, if you feel weak, you need to go, thank you, Lord, that you're increasing my strength. Come on, he's turning up the dial. Whomp. Level four, level ten. Amen. Make you a terror to the enemy. He's made you a terror to the enemy. Amen. Isaiah 41 verse 10, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. My righteous right hand. Philippians chapter 4 verse 13, we love this. I can do what? All things through Christ who strengthens me. The phrase I can do means to have or exercise Force. It means endowed with strength, to be strong in body, to be robust or sound in health. That's what that word, those, those three words mean together. Vine states that this word indicates a more forceful strength than dunamai. Now think about that. I saw that and I went, I'm taking my force up a level. I'm releasing a higher level of force. Now watch this. This is wonderful. <laughs> it, it is seen, the same word is seen in James 5.16. As avails the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man or woman. What? Avails. Avails. What does it mean? It means it prevails greatly. The fervent effectual prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, pr- tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. In other words, this is even stronger than dunamai. This is prevailing power that happens not only in prayer, but in your action of what the Lord asks you to do in submission to Him. You are not only coming with God's power, His weapon, His strength. You say, what are we doing right now? We are taking weapons and destroying images in your mind that you're too weak, that you can't make it, that you won't succeed in what God has asked you to do. 
Now, I'm not going to tell you God's going to anoint you to do everything you just want to do. <laughs> you know, we've talked about this, okay? Lord, save the world, and you want to eat your potato chips on the couch. <laughs> Even if they are anointed. <laughs> Amen? In other words, you, there's a go, and in the go is where the flow of power is. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Bob Yandian said it this way. In the Greek, this verse reads, I am strong for all things in the one who constantly infuses strength in me. That's the actual rendition in the Greek. I am strong for all things in the one who constantly infuses strength in me. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 10. It says, finally, my brethren, and this is the last verse, be what? strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, verse 11, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You're to be strong, strong in the Lord. So the devil comes to you and he says, you're not going to make it. You don't have enough strength. You say, you're right, devil, and I'm not counting on my strength one bit. I'm counting on the Lord's strength. And you whip that thought with a powerful spiritual weapon. These verses are weapons in your hand against your enemy if you speak them. Because the power of life and death is where? It's in that tongue. It's true for salvation and it's true for sanctification. Amen. It's true for the growth, the development, the discipleship of the believer who's been converted. We speak what God says about us. We take thoughts captive. We tear down strongholds. The devil tried to tell me I'd be addicted to things my whole life. And I'd never get free. And I got a hold of scriptures like, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. I, can't, I, I could not tell you the Greek. I didn't know how it worked. I just said, Lord, thank you that it's working. Brother Hagin said to do that. I'm not kidding. This is how I did this. And then over time, you go, where did that addiction go? Because I took the sledgehammer of the word, and I was beating on that stronghold. And I didn't quit, and I felt like it. And I didn't give up, and I felt like it. And I didn't walk away. I didn't quit pursuing. And there were times I had every thought in the world in my head saying, you're not going to make it, you're going under. And in the midst of that, I had to get up and go, ha ha, devil, I cannot be defeated. Because greater is he who's in me than he who's in the world. There were times I had to stand up in the middle of situations. I could give you story after story. But in the middle of the situations and go, Lord, I didn't come up with this idea. You did. You, it was your idea to do this ministry. It was your idea to do... You're, you're the one. It's your fault. <laughs> not mad. I wasn't mad. You know what I mean? I don't think the Lord's not nervous. How I many know he's not insecure? He's looking down at me, go, oh, he's mad, guys. What are we going to do? You know? All right, so <laughs> anyway, I, this is you. So, Lord, I thank you. There's nothing I can do in my natural. But when I'm weak, I think I'll glory in my infirmity for a while. Come on, that's what Paul said. He said, I'm going to glory in my infirmity. Why? That the strength of God. Come on, you got to think about this, because I know, I, don't li I didn't like that verse either, but it's in the Bible. But I un once I understood it, I went, oh, I see what he's doing here. He's saying, yeah, in the natural, I may be pressed, but I'm not. I may be persecuted, but I'm not abandoned, right? I may be, I may be struck down, but I am not. Why? Resurrection's working in me. Paul said, I have the sentence of death in myself, that the life of God, our faith, could be in one place. <laughs> come on, come on. We, uh, we, were, we were praying the other day with somebody, and, and the Lord said to me, the safest place is out on the water with me. That's the safest place. And I found it to be true. 
How about you? I found it to be true. Well, I'm out where I, I can't figure out how it's going to work. I don't know where the money's going. I don't know how this is going to happen. I know. Glory to God. Father, you're really going to get glory to yourself. And we're going to look so smart, even though we're not. Because <laughs> the Lord told me he took the simple things of the world to confound the wise. I know what he got in me. <laughs> right? But he's not looking for your genius. He's looking for your submission. Come on. And you're strong in him and in the power of, finally, my brethren, be strong. Amen?